got a PowerPoint presentation, and this was originally made by Paul, and I've changed about half of it to talk more about how to do these things in SAS that he does. Because he explains it in the, in the PowerPoint, but I don't think he really went as far into it as I think he could have. Um, and to have it a little differently, the file that I'm working off of is actually on Dropbox right now. So if you're online, if you can get to the wireless and go to the Dropbox right now, um, the actual SAS code for this presentation is on there. And so that's what I'm going to open up. So that through the presentation we can we can execute the commands without having to type it all in. So let me, I'm opening it up here. Diversity presentation. It would be called diversity presentation. And I did find out how to make this a little bit bigger. Maybe I can make it even bigger than that. Can we put it on the screen? Yeah, that file is in Dropbox for today. What is it called? It's called diversitypresentation.sass. We don't have it. It's on, it's on Blackboard. A black, I'm sorry. Blackboard. I don't have access to his drop. That's his Dropbox. I don't, I can't, I can't put stuff on his Dropbox, so. Sorry. Uh, and there is a way to make this even bigger. One of these. So these are the preferences, and it's different for each. Because I got it to work the other day, <coughs> and somewhere in okay tools. There you go. So to, to make the make your font bigger, you go to Tools, cus, uh, Options, and Enhanced Editor. But it only works for the editor screen. Doesn't mm -hmm. make anything else bigger. So, so in here, you can blow it up a little bit more. So I hope that y'all did read some of the stuff for today's lecture, because it will help a bit. There's there's quite a bit of things about diversity, um, but I have to say a lot of it really is going to be for reference. If you want to use one particular type of diversity or the other, because they go into detail for about two or three pages on each type, because there's there's a lot of them. Right? Um, so the purpose of doing this is that diversity is just an indicator of environmental health, and when we talk about diversity, we're meaning not just basic numbers of, of how much biomass is there, but actually how many different kinds of species there are and what is the spread of those species. So in order to do this, we're going to make a small data set in SAS. That's the SAS code that's from that file. So if you have it on your computer right now, you can just run that. This is the, the code that you use to actually input a data set. Um, without doing the import, you're actually typing it by hand. That's how you would do it. And typically, I never do this. Most, most hardly, you know, you're always opening an Excel file and putting it in. But this is how it is. And then we sort it, and we end up with this table. And this is a very, very tiny table. And we're going to expand this thing and do a lot of math with it today. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be expanding this table into a huge table to find out what the diversity is of these species within these samples. Okay. So in my SAS, okay, I'm going to run just this code. So if I look at the log, five observations, three variables, 
and this should just all be in my work folder. Okay. SP data. Okay. So if you've gotten to that point, so how many that are kind of following along with SAS right now? If you're, you like, you can get to that point. Okay. Because we're going to be going back and forth between this and, and that. So there's two components of diversity, and the one that we talked about on Tuesday was richness, right? That's just the total number of species. That is how, how many how many are there in this sample? We have five species total we found. But there's also this other concept called evenness. So the evenness is how is these species distributed among? So do we have we found five species, but did we find five species and and there's only one individual of four of them, and then the other the other species had 20 or 30 of them. So then it wouldn't be very even distribution, right? So what we're trying to find out now is not just, you know, how many species we had, but is there a dominant species in this list? Is it an even distribution? Or what is the, the types of distribution among them? Okay. And in order to do this, we actually need our tables to look like this instead of what we had previously. What we need to have is we need to have a column that says for each species. So if we have species one, two, three, and four, we need to know how many individuals of those species were in the sample. And in that, then we could find, well, the total number and then the R. So if you notice that the R, the richness, is exactly the same among the three samples, right? But in between those three samples, our evenness, our distribution is very, very different. Right, so in, in the first sample, our distribution is even across all four. And then at the very bottom sample, sample three, there's 30 individuals of species one, but only three or four individuals of two, three, and four. And even though, so it's the same number, the distribution is completely different, right? So it might tell you something about the health of that system that, well, we have one dominant species here. And that's a, a very vital piece that we need to, that we need to be able to analyze. So why don't we keep records looking like the second table and instead we're doing it like the first table? Because we, we really need it to be in this form in order to do a diversity analysis. We need to know which ones are actually zero that we didn't find in order to do this analysis. So we have, we have a database problem essentially, right? Yeah, we, we do have a database problem. Are you giving me weird looks? But we do, because we store files like the first side, where we only found the species, so that's what we write down in the row. Okay? So the reason we don't do that is because we're going to end up with an exploding database if we do it this way. So that's saying that every time we go out and do a sample, and we found one more species, well, then we've got to add another column for it. We found, and then we go out again, we find another species, we've got to add a column for it. Um, so we never know how many species we're going to find. So we don't have a giant matrice to, to house our data. You know? and, and there's a couple other issues. What if we discover a new species? Does that mean we have to go back and fix every single file we own, every single database we had and study we did to add another row to the column? Um, essentially, we would never have a complete data set if we, if we did this. Okay, so does that make sense? Why we can't, so we can't store it the other way without doing something special or storing it in some giant SQL type system. But then we would never have a physical table. And there's another example, um, one of the other postdocs in our lab, Michael Ruscher, he discovered that we had two species. We had a species and it was, um, you know, code 81, another code, something else. So he discovered it's actually the same species, it's just one is the male and one's the female. So then what do you do about that? Would you, would you go back and fix everything? So then you get into these database issues, okay? So the problem is, is that we need to actually create this other data set every time we want to do this diversity analysis. And there is a way to do it in SAS, it's called prep, uh, a proc transpose. And the issue I had when Paul taught this was, for me, when someone says transpose your table, I'm thinking of the Excel form. Excel means I'm transposing, I'm taking the columns on the top and I'm flipping it with the columns on the bottom. 
So I took the same table and I did a transpose in Excel. And the way to use a transpose in Excel, you just select it and then you, you do a paste and in the paste you could say transpose and you transpose those. So all it does is just it flipped my rows and columns. But it didn't do what Paul wants it to do, which is actually expand the set. Okay? And just to be extra confusing, there is a proc expand that'll do this without using the transpose, but it only works for time series data. It's actually really helpful though. So a proc transpose, what it will do is say, I have monthly data, but I want weekly data. And so what it can do is you do a proc transpose and say, I want to change month to week, and it fills in the observations for the week. Okay? It'd just be really helpful if it did that for this, because that's essentially what we're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the first transpose of a proc transpose, and that's what the proc transpose looks like. And it's in, this, in the code. So I take the first data set, this is the first table of SP data, that's this, okay? And I'm saying the out is transpose, and then I say prefix S. The prefix, all this prefix S does is it takes whatever characters are here and sticks it in front of these columns. And what a transpose does is it actually now, it expands it. It, it expands that table to fill in for each of these species the actual value because we're using by value and by sample, okay? And we're gonna talk later what the ID thing does. ID is only for proc transpose. So if you actually forget about it from now on, probably wouldn't hurt you none. But essentially it's the same thing. We're interested in the value, so it's value, but we're doing it by sample. So it's by sample, so by sample means we just want one row per sample, okay? But now we're expanding out the species counts. And so you can see in here now, for sample one, for the entirety of all sample one, we found six individuals right here of species one, and we found five individuals of species two. We didn't find anything of three and four. They weren't there, and it's missing. But you can see it actually has to go through the entire data set to fill all these out, because we didn't, you know, the first sample doesn't know what those other species are. So we had to have some, some method of figuring out, well, what are the species names, right? How many of them did we need to fill this row, to fill all, all of our columns out? Okay. So I'm gonna go back to SAS. And I did annotate this file, and there's some more help. I found some websites that might be useful on the different procedures. So if you have issues with those procedures, you could, you could uh, look at that. So here I'm gonna run it, okay? And then we get our, our transposed table, right? And the log would say now, now we only have two observations and six variables, right? So we only have two, two samples, but we need, now we have six. All right, so now what we can do is we can reverse this process and transpose back. Just like in Excel, if I transposed in Excel and transposed the rows and columns and flipped it, and then you transpose it again and you flip it back, the same thing happens in SAS when you do their transpose. But what you can do is when you run transpose again, you get this table, which is exactly what we had before but now we have all those missing values because the transpose procedure found all those species out of the whole file that, you know, of ever, the entire file of how many species we used, it found them and put them in these rows and then now we flipped it and flipped the table back. So now we end up with the original, so this is the original table of what we had we started with, but now our new table is the same exact thing just where the missing species are, right? So if you could see in sample one, we found, for species one, we found six right here. Species two, we found five individuals, but then we didn't find anything for species three and four, but it knew that was in the table. So now we have these rows here, 
So now we've expanded our set, essentially. Okay. So to kind of reiterate what we did, this is the file that we had in our database of what we, what we went out in the field and what we took and what we counted. What we want in order to do our diversity analysis is we need this table, the table that has the zeros in it, right? In order to do that, we transposed once. That gave us this, right? We transpose again, and we get this with a little bit of extra fun in here that we'll go through what this stuff means, okay? So what we did is we transposed again, and then now Paul, what he did is he did a data step to clean it up. Just like in Tuesday, we did something and now we, we cleaned up, and essentially all we're doing is we're changing the periods to zeros, and we're figuring out the names and taking that out and putting it here. And I'll go through that in the next slide. But does that make sense, kind of what we're doing and why we needed to do that? Yeah, now maybe? Okay. So what is this whole if thing that we had in the last code? Because we you know, introduced another, we introduced something strange in here. This conditional, this is a conditional. If value equals period, then value equals zero. Okay. So what we're saying is, is we needed to run a conditional statement. And SAS represents all missing values as a period. That's like one of the big, big SAS isms is a period represents missing data. It's not a zero. Because, you know, when you think about it, if you put a zero in it, you're really saying you counted nothing. And so if we went back on our old set, are you really sure you counted nothing? If you discovered a new species, are you really sure you counted nothing? You know, you can't be 100% sure you didn't. It's just that it wasn't there. So it's really missing data. And in SAS, the missing data, when you go and, and run an analysis, it just ignores those rows. Because if you have a zero in it, that means you're actually going to use that. You're actually going to use it in math. <coughs> All right. So we can use a conditional to replace them with zeros. And so in here, if the expression is true, whatever this expression is, is true, then you execute whatever code you want. And that could be a whole block of code. That could be just one statement. It could, it, it could be as long or small as you want. And then there's also this optional thing called an else. So if you think of, well, if this is true, then do this. Well, what if it's not true? Then we do, we could do the else, all right? And these are different operators that you can use in your expressions. So we had, in this last one, we had value equal EQ. And it does, I got this is kind of tiny. Try to blow that up a little bit. Let me, let me just blow it up so you can see it real quick. You can use these operators if you're comfortable with other languages. Typically, you use these kinds of things, right? Greater than, greater than, equal to. But SAS also has these keywords. And I've actually gotten in the habit of just using the keywords. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, but otherwise, you could use either, either one of these, okay? And so if you're trying to build a statement to say, well, I want all the data if it's from a sample greater than sample one. You could do that. What if I want all the data uh, from after February 1st, 2016? You can say that as part of your conditional. So these conditionals, I mean, it's, it's really gonna be critical to you to do any kind of analysis on. Or you say, I wanna run analysis on everything except from this one station. Leave that one station out. Then you could say, as if station not equal to station zero, then do this, right? So a code style suggestion. 
this is a computer science thing. So there's a difference between style and valid. These two things are valid. Perfectly valid. They run, they do exactly the same thing. Is species equal period, then species zero. Is species equal period, then species zero. But in, as a computer scientist, when you use basically any other language whatsoever, when you're trying to evaluate is this equal to this, most of them do equal equal. They use, they use this. So if you say if x equal equal 5, Right? That's that's is saying is, is that equal five? Because if you if you did this, you're actually assigning five to X in pretty much every other language. In SAS apparently they don't care. Because this says that this is assuming this has to be an expression. You can't you can't run a statement in that. But does it make sense why it might be confusing for someone reading this to say why is that equal to that, then this is equal to that? What am I actually doing here, right? And so that's why I, I, use, I use these conditionals like this. That's why I use them. And if you get anything from Paul, he'll use this. In fact, probably 98% of my code will use that too. Just because I know now that this means, a, this means an expression, a logic expression. It doesn't mean assign it the value. But it really confused me when I was first working with SAS and I was getting code like that. I had no idea what was actually being executed or not because I was seeing stuff like this, okay? Okay, so the richness is pretty easy to calculate, right, of, um, of doing this. So we wanna just find the richness, that's just the total number. We did that yesterday, all right, but what we can do is we can use this proc transpose without an ID statement. And so we talked about what does the ID statement do. So if we go in here, I've got one of these with and without the ID statement. So this is without the ID statement. And it says TSP no ID. I'm going to try to get both of them together. Okay, what's what's different between these two? Well, yeah, it, we did. We did a transpose. We we transposed one with the ID statement. Transposed it the same thing without the ID statement. So the one with the ID statement is here. The one without the ID statement is the one above. What is the difference between those two tables? The data moved. Mm -hmm. Something's not right. Which is what's not right? Pretty much took out species four and shifted that column out, but still used the values and made them for species two and species three. Right. So, according to the SAS PDF box of what the ID statement does, the ID statement will go through the original table. It'll go through this table and use these as the values that it uses for the rows. It'll use those for those values. And then when you use the prefix on it, on front of it, the, we said the prefix S, so it puts an S in front of that. So SAS comes in here and says, okay, I'm gonna transpose with ID species. And so we look and we say, okay, how many total species do we have in that column? How many total species do we have? Four. Yeah. All right, good job, four. We got four species, right? So we're gonna make a column. We're gonna make four columns. One, two, three, four. Right? 
two, three, four. And uh, we're going to put the prefix we said we're going to use before it. So the prefix was S. So if you said prefix species, it would write out species and then one. Then species two, species three, species four. When you don't use the ID statement, you get this more concatenated file. But the reason why we might want to use this is that we don't have to have all those rows in order to just calculate the total number. All we're interested in is the total number. So as part of Paul's lecture, he wanted to have the concept of using a transpose without the ID statement as a, well, it, it was superfluous, we didn't need the ID statement because all we were doing was we we're just going to count this number anyway. If we're all we're going to do is just count all those up, it doesn't matter that we, we put them in the correct order. It doesn't matter that, well, we said this is species two and that's not actually species two. That, none of that really matters. All we're trying to do is just get the end number, okay? But as far as I'm concerned, you really should always use the ID statement because that was the whole purpose of you doing it to begin with. Yeah, so does that make sense? So it's just trying to tell you what the ID statement does. It, you have to use it, and you have to use it when you go back to the transpose. You have to use it because we, we are interested in putting that number, what species it is, with the actual value. Right, in order in order to find out our true answer of this. Because if we did that same and we didn't use ID here, and we did we would do this transpose and we would only have three species here, we'd come out with an incorrect table on the bottom end when we do it. Okay. But Pretty much just like everything Paul does. So now he's going to introduce some crazy stuff into here. So if you can see this, now we've got arrays. That's another another item we're going to go through. And we've got this of. So right here, we're calculating the total number of species and the total number of individuals. And we're having to count all of these rows together, right? That's what we need to do. And in order to do that, we had to make an array, and then we had to use that array in these functions to count. Okay? And I'm going to explain how, how you do that. And it's not as hard as it seems to do arrays. I'm going to tell you, I never used arrays in SAS. Hardly ever, ever, ever used them. But they're actually a really good time-saving thing to do. And I'll tell you why. Okay? So what is an array? When you execute the statement array s, s1 through s100, it's going to create 100 columns in your table. So you take a table that just had, say if we just had s1, s2, s3, s4, when you run that statement, now it's saying make 100 of them. So now this table blows up all the way down to S100. Okay. So we get all those in between. And they label them S1 through S100. Okay. But why would we do this? And it's because now we can group those columns together and we can logically call them S for some procedures. Can't do it for this one, unfortunately, which really sucks, I think. I tried to do it, and it didn't work. But it does work for other things. You can just call a procedure on S now. And so you say, I want a procedure on S. You're saying, I want that procedure run over those 100 columns. The same thing. Okay. So what we can do is we call of S1 through S100. 
and using the in, this in function, it just counts. It's going to count all the non-zero entries in this column and then just produce you the number and stick it where you want it, which is TS here. So in this example then, if you said TS was equal to this, then it would just be five, okay? But we can use this of statement. The of statement you can only use with an array and it says do that, but do it over all of those columns. So now it counts all 100 columns, the entire set, top and bottom, and then produces the count and then sticks it in TS. Okay. Okay. How is that so far? So does everybody understand how you would count variables then? So if I did So now everybody understands what we're doing here. So here's a question that I've got. This is from last lecture. When I run this, this data step, in the next file, which is called diversity, do I have those 100 tables? Why don't I have those 100 tables? Because I dropped them right here. Does it matter that I drop them first? Because no. that's always last. Again, this is a style thing. This is a Paul style thing. He throws the drop up at the top, and that really confused me so much because I was thinking, how can you run, and we're saying count this whole array structure, how can I do that if I threw it away, right? It's because the drop goes last, always goes last. You're doing the rest of the logic first, okay? So in the same step, he creates the array, uses it, and drops it. That's typically how you use arrays. So then basically what you're saying, no matter where in the script you put drop, it will always run it last. It should. Okay. Shouldn't, it shouldn't matter. <laughs> but it's stuff like this which is confusing. Again, it's a style issue. When I write drops, I throw them at the end. Because I, I, I really am a big believer and I'm trying to specify what the heck I'm trying to do. But, you know, it's just one of those things. SAS is the way it is, all right? But this is just a very typical use of an array statement is I'm using this group of variables and the only reason why I'm using this group is because of this right here. Because I want to use them here for this analysis. And, and then I drop them afterward. So they don't, they don't come into the file when we're done. So it's just a matter of that. All right. So if you read the, the literature that Paul sent, there is a ton of diversity indices. And you could actually spend this whole lecture talking just about the indices and not about the SAS code. So I kind of had to make a design switch and say, well, I think I wanted to focus more on the SAS code, not as much on the diversities, because for one, I'm not the total expert when it comes to, diverse, to, to those indices, and the literature is probably king when it comes to that. Uh, but there are a couple of key ones in which we're going to really look at, and that's really the H prime and J prime are kind of the ones we mainly look at uh, when we do our stuff. But all of these are essentially made to solve one type of diversity issue. Um, as far as when I read through the literature, people would make a new indice because their species distribution was a certain way. And it's a certain way because that was the way that one is, so we made a new indice. So I guess you could, you can get famous and you can make an indice <coughs> and then you could, you know, have the term that you or whatever you do. Okay. So how do you calculate indices? We've been talking this whole time. So we have our data set here, okay? And what we wanted was we need now to make an indice. And this is Paul's code to do it. All right? This is his textbook code that he's had for years. 
But he's at, this is the first version of his code, and he's got uh, two versions, and then I put a different version of the code in the homework. And the reason is because we're going to discuss, this whole part was to discuss logic in the program and also doing flow control. And so the first thing he does is he takes the array, the, the transposed array, we make our array of 100 columns, and then he puts a drop statement on the top, <coughs> but you know what I mean, that means it runs last, right? Um, and then we calculate the total number and total n, total s, okay? And then we do a bunch of other stuff. And we do logic in here. So if total number is zero, then go to no sp. So has anybody ever heard of a go to statement? You ever heard of that? It's a computer science thing. Before, when the dinosaurs were young, and there was no such thing as flow control, all they had was a go-to statement. All a go-to statement says is, if it executes, you move to this position in the code. That's it. And this is a label, no SP. This is how you make labels in SAS. So you can say whatever, no matter what it is, and then a colon, and there's the name. The only time you would ever use a label is you're going to use a go-to statement. Okay. So typically, I never use these because I don't use go-to statements. Um, and the reason is this is actually like a computer science 101 thing. Whenever you go into a computer science class, it's almost like first day, first lecture, and, they, and somebody <coughs> asks, why don't we use a go-to statement? So does anybody, understand, does anybody know why we don't use go-to statements now when it's 2016? Any idea? You can still use it. It's still in the languages. You might, you might maybe have an idea why. So the problem is it, it creates this thing called spaghetti code. And spaghetti, spaghetti code just means it's going all over the place and I have no idea what it's doing. So in a program like this, when you only have one conditional, it, it doesn't really matter. You can figure out where it's going. But if you do this and you have a program of a thousand lines, you'd have no idea where you're going. Okay. So, other words, if it's zero, then go to zero. All right, go go to here. But I'm gonna tell you why we actually have to do this. If tn is zero, so let's say let's look, just look at this. Ignore this stuff for now, and just say h prime. And this is how we calculate h prime. What happens if h prime is zero? We divide by zero, and the program will crash. So the only reason why he has this in here is because if that's zero, this is going to be zero. We can't do that, and that's going to crash. Okay. But there's another way we can take care of that. So this is the first bit of structure. If it's zero, then go to there. Otherwise, we're going to do this bit of structure. Okay, I'm going to talk about this do over s thing. It's not do over as in, let's do it again because it's wrong. It's actually a loop. But that's the, the main beef of his program. Okay. So there's multiple ways in SAS you can actually repeat code as a loop. This do over thing is actually pretty cool. And if you're going to be looping in SAS, you're probably going to be using do over. And the do over is you give it an array, and that says you execute the loop for every array element, which is really handy it's because we had we had that element of 100, the S, S1 to S100. And so I want to execute that loop for every spot. So if I go back, you can actually call it S here. You don't have to do the S1 through whatever. So we're actually logically calling that group, that array. And we could just say, for that whole array now, I want to run this part. And so that's what this is doing right here. Okay. So there's another bit, and I, I wanted to say one you might use is called a do while. And what you do is you do while some logic expression is true. So what you could have done in this code before is and say, and said, well, if it's zero, then get out of it. We could say, well, do while this is not zero, and then you can execute that. Uh, but you've got to be really careful when you do this if you're not a programmer because this is a really, really good way to lock your computer up. Because 
if it's always true, you'll never get out and you'll walk your SAS up. So, so what does this say in here? As long as one is equal to one, and then I've got a new statement right here, which you might want to write down. This is the statement to actually print something to the log in your code. That's helpful. Put. So what it'll do is if I run this, it'll just print, I am looping forever, <coughs> again and again and again and again and again, and then I'll have to control the lead, and then kill SAS, and then come back. Because would there ever be a possibility that one does not equal one? Okay. You could just do do while one. Because this is just evaluating is it one or is it zero? Is it true or false? You could just say do while one. That's the do it forever loop. Okay. I, I mentioned do whiles because it can be handy to use them. Alright, it's a pretty handy thing. Just when you've never programmed before, just be really cautious because it's a really good way of locking yourself up. Okay? Um, so there's a little bit of more control you can do in looping. In any loops, you can do this. There's a statement called continue, and there's a statement called leave. So let's say we had a loop. And I, I want to say do over and see when I first heard do over I thought I'm going backwards or something but it really says I'm doing over the array s right so for every every one of those columns s I'm going to run the same thing and say if we get in a situation where well I want to do this block of code here Except if species is two. For some reason, I didn't want to run, I did not want to include two, species two, in this analysis. So what you could do is you could do an if statement, say, well, if species is equal to two, then continue. So if species is equal to two, then continue. So what it does, if that it is true, and you get to the continue, the continue says, I'm, I'm not going to run the rest of this. I'm going to go back to the start of this do over statement. I'm just going to go back up. And I finished my, you know, the, the loop is now finished, and we're going back up. Now, if we find something really bad to say, well, if I'm going to divide by zero, and say, well, if whatever number we needed, say total number is equal to zero, and that's going to lock me up or crash my computer, then you can say leave. <coughs> so if that evaluates to zero, then what this does is it actually breaks us out of the loop entirely. So we don't run this at all. Okay. So there's two real important controls. And the last little bit that he used is this thing called output and return. Let's go back over here. The only time you would ever, ever see these is if someone was using go to statements, for one thing. That, but you're going to see them because people that use SAS, most of them have written programs since the 60s and they're using this. So you've got to kind of translate stuff from old, the olden ways. But what the output and return does is it says, I'm going to write the data now, and I'm not going to wait to the end of the whole data step to do it. Because just like the, lead, the, the drop statement that waited until the end, when you process all your things in your loops, it's being stored temporarily in memory before it actually writes that table. So it's processing these things, and then at the very end it writes it. So what the output statement does is it says, write it right now to the set immediately and not wait until the end of the data step. But you might have to do something like this if you ever get yourself in a position where you're writing a conditional, because I've seen this a lot, this is, this is a typical issue, and you're getting a table that doesn't make any sense. And you're thinking that, well, I did a conditional, I said, well, if this is true, then I need this value, and I need this value in this loop. And so what you have to do is you actually have to write, write it out each time. 
so that you could save what you were using to use it again. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? Slightly? But I've seen that happen where you run a code like pulse code that you need to actually loop and to do things. And if you, if you didn't do the output, then it, you got a weird response at the end. And when you did the math by hand, it didn't jive up. And so that was the issue of what you needed. You needed that output. Right. OK. So now that we're out, we're, we're, we're running out of this. This, this would be really hard to do if, if you couldn't transpose and you couldn't do the loops. And this would be really difficult to do in anything other than SAS. Because again, we started with a table, we started with a three by three matrix, and that's it. So we're working on files that have maybe a thousand or so records. So having to, for one, put it back into this form. So if we go from, coming from this to this, is actually really tough to do without SAS, for one. And then using this to come up with the diversity you're going to have to actually program in SAS to do that with those loops in order to, to actually do the analysis. But what it only turns out to is about that much code, which is not a lot. Okay. But I hope, at least in this, that maybe that the that you kind of have an idea now what transpose does and what do loops are and how you would use them in SAS. Because another thing that I have actually seen through the years is a student comes into Paul's lab and says, I've got this table and it looks exactly like our table one, but I need it to look like this other thing. I don't know how I would possibly do that? How I would how would I would expand that? And then and then he's like, just use a transpose, and then it's then it's there because it's hard to think of in terms of that. Um, so I hope that I at least explain that a little bit. Um, so in part of diversity, maybe a little bit of advice is, you know, everything is species dependent, um, and depending on your sample sizes might depend on what you're gonna use. So when your sample size is equal, just your standard R works just fine. And that for most things that we do, we just use H prime and J prime for evenness. I would really recommend if you're looking at diversity to start with those to get an idea of what the diversity is and then move to the next one. Um, so, Hills, for example, um, if it's really easy to interpret it because Hills is going to approach zero as a single species becomes dominant. So for me, when I look at a diversity index and I look at Hills, Hills is the most easy to see when you've got that one species that it's going to start overtaking. So like in our first example, like the very, very first table where it's had one species was the max, then this Hills in the C is going to be nearly zero. So it's going to tell me that, well, I've got one species that's way above the mark on that. Okay, so there is the homework out, and I think a lot of people have already gotten it off the Blackboard, right, for this time. And the homework is to do stuff that we did in the last class. And it's actually not that difficult. All you have to do is the mean statement. Okay? So. Be sure to get that done, and I'll be in the office today, tomorrow, if you need help with that. Okay. So, any questions on today's stuff that I can help you with? Like, do you think you're confident in maybe doing a transpose? Maybe. Okay. Okay. And again, this other code is up. This is the code. 
for the whole lecture. And so yeah, so here's the thing, what I did, this is what I did the pulse code. So in the first part, you had this big loop that said, if, um, if, it's, if it's zero, then we leave. What I did at the top is I said, it, I'm doing all for all of array s. If it's zero, then actually change it to missing. So I got rid of the zeros. So that was one structure there. And then he had another one down here that said, go to this other end. And I said, well, actually, if it's missing, then just continue. So that says we, we go back to the start here. So I felt like putting both of those in there just to, um, just to give you a difference of, again, it's correct either way. It just, gives, it just depends on how you look at it. And I also put a put statement here so when do you think that this put statement will execute? <coughs> yeah, so I'm saying do over s. And we've got s is the array s1 all the way to s100, right? Yeah. So already we're saying I'm going to run this 100 times for s. Now, if S is missing, now what do I do? I go back to the start. I just go back immediately. Don't execute the rest of this stuff. So if it's, let's say, what it, if S is five, then what do I do? Yeah, I keep running this. I run this, I run this, I run this, and then I print. And then I end, which means I go back up, right? And I keep doing that. Okay. So if I put a print above this if statement, do you think do you think it would print just as many times as that, or you would think it would print more times? It should be more. It should be more. Because we're, I mean, we're evaluating this if it's blank, and whenever there's going to be blanks in it, because we've got 100 tables, so most of these 100 are going to be blank, right? So we're going to print that one 100 times, no matter what. So if we put a put, a put statement here, if we say do over s, put hello, okay, and then we do the if. So if I do it over S, this is going to print 100 times. But then whenever that this is not a period, then I print this finished do over S loop. So at some points in here, then you'll see another, another line of code where it says, hello, 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 and then it said finish do loop, and then hello, hello, hello. So maybe a little exercise at home when you get this code. Throw that put in there and see what happens. In fact, if you want to, Throw some of the put statements in other places and see what happens. If you want to, if you want to see, you know, how many times did I go through that loop? How many times? If you put a put statement just in the general area, how many times do you think it would go? Okay. Anyway, that's a little bit of playing on your own if you want to try that. Okay. So I think that's it for today. If there's any other questions that you have, you good? So it, it printed five times the do over loop thing? Yep. Because there are five samples? Yes. Right. So. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you had 100 samples, it would print 100 times. But if you put one here, it print 100 times no matter what. Right. Right? So it only executed that five times. Again, this is a lot of work for a table that only had, that was, that was the tiniest little table ever. So we've we've really expanded. That's why I like to think of a prop means as a compress, because a means will compress your rows together. 
you know, you keep meaning, and you can meet, you can mean through those that hierarchy of data, back and back and back further, meaning further and further down, and a transpose, in a way, expands the set, right? We know it was something bigger than what we had before by sticking all those zeros in everywhere of stuff we didn't find, but we've fully expanded our set with transpose. So that's why I like to say a means is a compress, a transpose is an expand. So whenever you're thinking about expanding stuff, that's what the transpose does for you. Any other questions while I'm here? No? Makes sense? Yeah? Maybe better? I don't want to talk about it. Huh? I don't want to talk about it. You don't want to talk about it? Which everything made sense until you did the diversity index. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's complicated, but it works. It's complicated, but it works. Yeah. And again, it's SAS, so things don't do what you think it would logically do. Yeah. So you just have to know. And that's what makes SAS <coughs> hard. So, I thought you run this whole thing. And you know, I've actually not done this. What if I write a while always true thing? <coughs> I don't, if SAS would be smart enough to know that I've locked up and exited out? Or would it just lock up? <laughs> so, I'm going to fit this in here. while one equals one. <coughs> the wise if you are going to use loops do put the put statements in it so you can kind of see what's going on and there's actually a way of putting the put statement to put a variable in it as well but again it's a whole nother trick with that can I stop it <laughs> nope. I don't think so Never. I guess it Thank you.